uh, thank you, Ilona, for the, for the great talk. You gave me some material that I can leverage in mind. So I will talk a little bit about good and evil and another category of design as well. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, I, will, I will talk a little bit about my research here. And um, mostly um, good and bad design and these other categories that uh, we'll discover very soon um, that is more like related to uh, visualization. So I'm very much interested in like the design of visualization and the leveraging of visualization to communicate important messages. And uh, we have this uh, sad observation that many people who consume uh, visualization, many laymen, uh, may be misled by uh, visualization. So we are going to talk about uh, critical thinking here, what visualization does well, what it does not uh, so well, and how we can improve that uh, for the general public. So we are commonly exposed to claims um, made by different people about different topics, and oftentimes these claims are accompanied by uh, data and visualization to communicate these data. Uh, so these article numbers are important and valuable because this is what uh, you know support uh, evidence of the claims that people make. But when you use visualization, can we always trust the charts that we are, um, we are seeing that support a claim. And so speaking about good and bad design, we'll get there to in, to, to, in a minute. Uh, I'm not talking actually about design errors where numbers don't add up uh, or when visuals just are all over the place. So I'll give you like a few seconds to actually study this slide. Uh, this is poor design. This is not bad design as in, you know, like somebody didn't really know what they were doing and there's usability studies. This is wrong completely because it's off. It doesn't communicate anything. This one is one of my favorite. Uh, the question doesn't relate anyhow to <laughs> the chart actually. So we can see like those charts like um, crawling in the public space like more often than you would think actually, and this is pretty terrible. And this one that is related to uh, current um, you know political decisions in in Canada. I, I don't know actually when this was aired, and it was in the U.S. And this chart doesn't make any sense. And this it was aired on TV. How come? such example, like make it through like all of the filters that we should have, like before it's being aired on TV. This is pretty creepy. Uh, these ones are easy uh, examples that I hope most of the population will appreciate that there's something going wrong in there, but maybe some people don't catch the, the mistake directly and they may be misled, especially when there's a narrative that accompanies uh, these visu visuals. And there might also be other cases where the actual design decision is kind of uh, unfortunate. This person obviously didn't know about Venn diagrams and what it can evoke to people. So th there was no visualization in intended in this example, I suppose, I hope, uh, for this company because otherwise it's not a very recommendable one. So, <laughs> so no, the, what my talk is about is about real visualizations, the one that I believe were designed uh, with the aim, aim to present uh, data tr truthfully, to support a claim or to, to make an informed decision. And the question that we can have here, can we trust these visualizations? Uh, and so my answer would be yes and no. So visualizations are very powerful, but they can also be m misleading. So because we love US elections and <laughs> This topic is a recurrent one, especially uh, in visualization. So I'm putting this example. So you probably are all familiar with corporate maps. What do you believe is the problem with corporate maps when we see these kind of maps? So this one, let me just like, give you a little bit of context before we, we, we think about that. So this one was from the past election uh, in the US, not the midterms, but when uh, Trump was elected. And so what this map is showing is uh, the margin of victory for all of the counties in the United States. So it's an easy to read map because the darker red, uh, the more Republican, and the darker blue, the more uh, Democrats. So if you see like a very dark red uh, county, that's where like, you know, a lot of the people, the, the, like the higher the percentage of the people voting for uh, the Republican uh, party. So if we look at this map, it's all red, it's strikingly red. And so we're just like, wow, that's obvious. And Donald Trump like didn't steal his, his, uh, 
his position as a, as a president, but the, the problem here is that this visual representation doesn't, is not fair to the actual data that it represents. Because we should not uh, mistake um, the number of people voting for somebody with like an area, a geographical area that encodes how many people have, um, have voted. So 80% of the map is red, 20% is blue, but it's not, it doesn't mean that 80% of the population of the US voted for Donald Trump. So to see a more fair representation of the data that we were looking at, we should look at a bar chart, actually, that just like say a count of how many people put their ballot for one or the other candidate, right? And so what this chart uh, suggests, if you look at the bar chart, it's, it was actually pretty tight. And uh, so that's uh, uh, kind of uncomfortable, you know, uh, observation that we can make because uh, Donald Trump has put this map so many times, like in, in meetings and stuff, and like to Chinese uh, our president itself, like, look at that, like, there's no question, right? But actually, that's not the proper visualization to communicate this message. And I like actually this chart because uh, we can see also the evolution over the years, and there we have another interesting story. So we observe something uh, a little bit unexpected to me when I saw this one uh, for the first time. So you have there like the different uh, elections over the years, and we see uh, actually how many people voted for each party or each main candidates, finalists. And so it's not that like the Republican Party like just like you know <laughs> went like forward as much as we could think. Uh, populism didn't gain that much of like the popular like the votes uh, in itself. It's just like many of the uh, uh, sympathizer of like Republican Party just didn't have the energy to go and vote for whatever reason. And so like actually the red bar is a little uh, you know lower than it was in the previous years. So it seems that it has been more like of a disengagement of many of the uh, people not going to vote. Um, and it's pretty striking, right? Uh, if we look at the, the proportion here, we can pretty much say like half of the Democrats didn't, didn't like Democrat supporters didn't, didn't go out there. So, isn't there anything striking like or like that bothers you in my in my discourse here? I said half of the people supporting Democrats would actually not go and vote. Did you pay attention to the y-axis on my graph? That's a real graph. When I put the zero there. It's not half of the people. If you look at the thing in context, it's like it's a, it's a bit of people, but not half of the people. So you've been biased by my visualization and my discourse. I've used a, a deceptive visualization here. Actually, it's not very deceptive because you've got all of the information over there. I'm not lying. All of the data is here, but it's difficult for us to actually systematically uh, go and, and have this critical view of whatever is presented to us. So. This is like one of the most simple visualization that we encounter like on a daily basis. And it's this uh, technique that distorts the axis to give you a false impression of a large effect is very commonly used in the media. And I like that actually this uh, person from the Washington Post, this journalist has created many examples during the elections. And you can see um, how is um, actually sorted them, depending on who is posting, you would have like an exaggeration for one or the other candidates. So you have like those that exaggerate for um, Trump's lead on the uh, top left of the chart and those who exaggerate uh, um, Hillary's lead. And this has a tremendous impact on how people are going to like react to these charts or this information. That may trigger me like I see Trump like he's leading so I go and stand out of my couch and go and put a ballot. I see that Hillary is like you know leading and then I have this, uh, this impression that everything's gonna be fine and I let the others do the work for me so that might like have uh, and this is evil design. <laughs> this is not like, you know, uh, good or bad. This is intended. That's the goal of the, the, the journalists really know what they're doing. So, 
So to get to critical thinking, it's very important actually that we educate people to be you know, careful. And I get myself, like even with my extensive training, I get myself fooled every now and then, especially when there's a narrative and you're just like passively looking at something and there's a chart that seems to support the talk and then you may not always engage in like, wow, well, how much data points did you have? Like what, when is this data like, you know, created? Like when did you collect the data? And all of those things, is the visualization fair to the data? Did you aggregate things? There are many things that we don't have the reflex to think about, but we should engage more. And so to cultivate the critical thinking, I will uh, cover those, um, organize the talk around these three questions and show a bit of my research around that. And so we're gonna start with um, this one uh, question, how well do we understand the data that we see every day? Because if we don't actually understand the data, we cannot even engage in critical thinking if we don't know what the data is, is about, right? And so, to illustrate that, I'm going to survey the room. How many of you are drinking pop? I'm not, but I, I show you how <laughs> you should raise your hand. So do you know how much sugar there, are in, there is in these individual packages? Any idea? Okay, a can of Coke, the one of the le on the left most, is uh, 39 grams of sugar. How good is your sense of scale when it comes to grams of sugar? Is it a lot? Is it not so much? It's a lot. Mine is bad, actually. I, I have no idea how much intake I should, even though after, I, after doing this research, even though I should, no. Uh, I'm not so great because, like, Weighting sugar is not part of my daily life. So I just read the labels on things and I know, ah, oh, wow, that sounds okay. So one thing that can help is translating these quantities in terms of um, sugar cubes, for example. So if I re-express those grams of sugar in terms of sugar cubes, now it becomes pretty like alarming. Would any of you put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 sugar cubes in your mug of coffee? That sounds like a lot, excessively a lot. So that's um, a mechanism uh, that can help you like, better appreciate um, some data that we actually like, um, should be familiar with because that's part of our daily life. Just to push the thing a little further, did you know that your recommended intake was 25 grams of sugar daily? So by the time you drink a can of Coke, you've, you're already over this uh, limit. And again, this visualization can help you. Ilona was talking about the cost of the war. I made this slide on the fly. Is it the right figure? 4.6 trillion. That was this week, though. earlier this week. It's yeah, I have other slides that are like a, a year late. And I guess it's, yeah, I should update my slides <laughs> on a second minutes. basis, yeah, by minute. How good is, again, how good is our sense of scale? Like about four, what is four that six trillion in terms of like, it, it goes beyond, I wish I knew like better about this magnitude in terms of money, but this is something that goes beyond everybody's, uh, you know, sense here. Um, so my original uh, slides are like talking about the national debt uh, in the US. And I like that in Manhattan, uh, people can see this big billboard. It updates all the time with the current uh, U.S. gross uh, national debt, and that was in February, so it's probably gone like <laughs> still more. Uh, but again, like the point is like 20 trillion. How much is that? This is difficult to to grasp uh, for us human who manipulate like not uh, big bills worth one trillion or, or anything, right? But before we move on, let me show you the Canadian version of this debt clock, because it exists. Or, uh, more precisely, it has existed, actually. Uh, this is from 2011, this footage. And it's great that uh, the debt clock was mounted on this car here, and it, it, it went all around the country, showing the debt. It's less impressive than the US ones, but it's still, you know, in, in billions. Again, these are the figures from, uh, from February also this year. So back to my point, how much exactly is that? And so we can have, I will try to have the video showing and have some sound, but if not, that's okay. It's not gonna be as you know, impressive as it, it, it should. 
So there's a video here that's going to uh, show you how we can better appreciate this amount of money. So here's a $100 bill. This is an amount that people commonly manipulate and can relate to. So we understand what $100 uh, mean to us. And so this author has done like a fantastic video that shows to you progressively how stacking those bills mean uh, in terms of volume in space. So that was 10,000. This is what $1 million would look like. $100 million, it's not that big of a pile of bills, right? But it's a lot of money already. So we are up to uh, now $2 billion. And note all of those indicators, like of familiar objects, like a plane, to give us a sense of the scale of these, uh, these piles of, um, of money. So this is like a field of $1 trillion worth uh, in space, uh, if you were to stack $100 bills. Goes on and on. Still $1 trillion. And there we go, building skyscrapers of those bills because it's like we're still far from the four trillion uh, that uh, is the uh, US debt. And this was again like made before, I guess it's about three trillions or something. And you see how these 20 trillions, how these skyscrapers like just like, you know, intimidate the, the Statue of Liberty. So this is very powerful of a mechanism. Building on this one a unit, $100 unit, that we understand and we see like, wow, what if we were to occupy space with this? And like, oh, that's, uh, that gives us a better sense of the magnitude of, the, of this, um, this measure. So this mechanism, that's what we call a, a concrete scale. We didn't invent the concept, but nobody had researched. Like infographics use this concept a lot of the time. And so we coined this term, concrete scale, as being a visualization that conveys a complex measure by re-expressing it using familiar objects from the real world. And so a measure can be complex, not because of its magnitude, but because the scale in itself is something that is abstract to us, like sugar, grams of sugar is still abstract to me. Grams of fibers, what does it mean? I have never seen a fiber, I don't know how, how much it weighs, actually. And so it can be also uh, complex to process because of its like magnitude that goes beyond our our own um, sense right and so we studied like the cognitive processes that we can use cognitive mechanisms that we can use to help people actually better relate to those data so we've just seen an example of unitization using a different object re-expressing using a different unit instead of grams of sugar i use a sugar cube that you better understand instead of the one dollar, I use a dollar bill and the actual space. So this is reunitization. And you have other mechanisms such as anchor and adjustment. It's often the case when you see like the CN tower close by to something else to give you an appreciation of the size of an object. That was the soccer field used to give you an, an appreciation of an area. And analogy, it's like whenever you say the moon is to the sun, the same as uh, like this, like how do you call that, Berlin? Like, the, like oh. marble. marble is to a tennis ball to give you a sense of the relative you know, size of two objects. So we've studied these things and uh, this can be a, like a powerful mechanism to help people like better understand data. So back to my question, how well do we understand the data that we see every day? We've learned with these examples that some measures may be difficult to grasp, even though we believe we, we understand them. And uh, one mechanism is like to relate data to more familiar concepts to help us better grasp this. So second point, how well do we, do we understand data that is represented visually? And we've seen an example of this um, bar chart. So when being presented with a visual representation of data, it, it is not granted that the audience will get the right mental model. Imagine I was well intended in my talk and wouldn't think that you wouldn't check by yourself like the y-axis, you could be easily fooled and like go away with like the wrong information just because I didn't make the effort of you know, pointing that to you. 
And this is very common. We cannot expect like all of the audience to actually decode correctly all of the parts of the visualization, right? And so being able to understand visualization is becoming like very essential skill because visualization uh, is not only taking part of, uh, you know, it's not only in our work workplace, it's also like at home and we can see that on, on, on TV, etc. So a lot of the information that we consume is conveyed through visualization. So it's important that we have like this very critical view of a visual representation of data. So we've seen the y-axis, but there are like uh, other examples. So visualization can be deceptive or misleading by design, and we'll go to an evil example here. So this chart uh, represents the number of murders committed um, using firearms in Florida. And uh, what happened after Florida enacted its tens, uh, your ground law in, in 2005, if we just read at the chart without paying much attention, uh, after this law, we see the line just like dropping. So we may think, well, wow, that's great. When you load for more guns, all of a sudden there was like less death by guns. Uh, so that's actually not quite the story. If we look at the chart as it should have been designed, you notice that the axis is upside down. And so this is like what people are like wired to decode mostly. But because we're wired to see like the zero on the bottom and the higher number at the top, this is how we can be very easily misled by a visual representation. Just mirror the, the chart on the y-axis. And that's the story. The more guns, the more deaths by guns. Makes sense, I guess. Tell the US. Uh, we can also be um, misguided because of our perception system that uh, can be biased. So I talked earlier about the corporate map. The problem here is uh, when you color one state with the actual value that it encodes, if the state is very small, it's not going to be given much credit in your screen relay state, whereas like a big state like Texas is going like, to be super prominent. It, it's not actually reflecting like a, how many data points you collected in each of those uh, of those states. So, like a better representation would be like you know, kind of scaling a state based on on the size or like the number of uh, data points that you have there. Or if you really want to count the number of states, you would more go for like a tiled uh, visualization like this one. So this one is good because it it still preserves also like the geographical. So. Both are good because if you have a poor, you know, geographical sense, and for some other different countries, it's not as easy to draw this, uh, this map. In France, we are not very much like, you know, drawing straight lines, like things are going all over the place. And so it's difficult to come up with something that's meaningful. You would have like a difficult time to relocate everything. But uh, this gives as much amount of pixels to every state, and then you can uh, more comfortably read the information that it's supposed to convey. And so the set of skills that is necessary to actually uh, decode and understand uh, visualization is what uh, we call uh, visualization literacy, same as literacy for like anything else, or data literacy for data. Uh, you can uh, develop visualization literacy skills. And so Research suggests that the general population has limited visualization literacy. There has been studies about that. And together with colleagues, we set out to uh, start working on, you know, trying to address this problem and looking at where it all starts, supposedly, and asking where and when do we learn these skills. At school, probably. And so that is true, that we encounter visualization very early on uh, in, in school. You may have recollection of manipulating candies or manipulables to actually count things and stuff. Uh, I forgot when I, learned, uh, when I learned how to read or construct bar charts. And uh, so because we forgot, all of our colleagues and me, uh, we had to go out there and study in schools whether, you know, visualization was part of the curriculum or not. So we created and coded visual materials from textbooks, like a lot of text 
like material. Uh, so these are math books um, from grade K to four. And so we found two, uh, like more than 2,000 visual representation. We studied 5,000 textbook pages. And we came up with some, you know, like findings about that. I will just share like the most interesting and um, valuable finding that we, we got. Uh, so we observed that across the different visual, uh, the visual representation, there's this continuum uh, that we have. So manipulating objects, actually, actually there's one that is missing here, like it's manipulating, manipulating real objects like physical objects and you count them and you arrange them, then you can go to like paper or like a 2D representation on a screen and you see those same objects, not very well arranged, then you can group them by similarities. These are the same objects. And there you, you start to build uh, some visualization. Uh, you can pile them up and then count them and align them. So you have uh, built a tally chart and then you can go on and go on all the way to the bar chart. So this continuum exists and it's actually not something that is uh, uh, out of the blue. This is pretty well known that this degree of, of, of abstraction exists uh, in other domains. Um, in uh, pedagogy, it's called the concreteness fading. That's, uh, that's the term. And so that suggests that new concepts actually should be presented first with concrete examples. That's how we learn. And then progressively abstract them. So this is great. We found this evidence, but I'm showing you a representation of this on the same data. And that's not what we did, we d we did observe. So we saw... Um, Barely, we did, we did encounter actually example of the same data encoded in different ways. And that's how you could learn better. You see like, oh, these are my objects. Now these are like icons of my objects. Now icons don't look like my objects, but like tokens. That's one degree of abstraction more. And then you can do things with tokens and you can, uh, you can pile them up. So one essential concept that we wanted to introduce in school was like same data, but different abstraction levels. So that children would learn how counting objects relate to uh, bar charts. And so this is uh, Celaviz. That's an application that we, uh, we developed and that builds on uh, traditional visualization principles like uh, synchronized views and animation. I uh, will just like trigger the video in a second. So you have here like a synchronized view of fish as an object and uh, the bar chart that correspond to the fish. And you will see like with basic, you know, interaction that we all know, like synchronized views, you can see like children tapping on, on, the, on the screen and see the correspondence, correspondence between uh, different views or an animation from one view to, to another more abstract one. So these are very simple principles in visualization uh, that weren't leveraged in school and we, we actually developed that and, and tested. From at grade K and grade, four, grade two with three teachers and 21 children, and we found, as amazing as it may sound to people in the room who have kids, I don't, uh, so children remained interested and focused for the whole 30 minute session. That might be, I should, you know, like uh, temper this claim, it's, it might have been because of like the novelty effect. We came in the classroom with tablets and then maybe, but uh, the teachers were like, you know, kind of skeptical about the effectiveness of, uh, you know, bringing tablets, like for keeping children engaged. So that was kind of a win because they were still interested in the, in the, um, in the application for 30 minutes. Predictable, but perhaps due to the novelty effect, the introduction of uh, new technology was disruptive to the classroom. Uh, so this might, uh, you know, evolve as those tools are, are introduced more broadly. We are happy to see that children interacted a lot and with no to minimal guidance, they were actually able to complete, uh, complete all activities. So they were asked to um, make two views match. So there was missing element on the view and they had to match the bar chart with, uh, with the counts of things. So there were a few exercises and they completed them successfully. So that was a great uh, observation. Um, it was great to observe peer learning. 
Uh, we learned that at this age, it's very rare that uh, children verbalize their thoughts and they actually engage in doing that on their own. So one ch child explaining to, the, to their neighbor like how to read a visualization or what uh, something meant in the interface, that was, uh, that was really good to see. And so finally, while did, we did not formally evaluate the learning power of our approach. Um, we still came back a week after to see if they had uh, learned anything, but this was uh, this is not again to take as uh, like strong evidence. We didn't have like large of a sample enough. We didn't have a baseline, but we still came back to the to the classroom and asked the kids to reproduce some of the exercises, but on paper this time. And one of the concept was a key in uh, in uh, tally charts. Whenever you have a token that is worth more than the unit. So imagine like this basket is worth 10 apples. And then this is a concept that is very difficult for children to like, you know, have this mismatch between the number of objects they can count on, this, on the display and how many objects this really represents or encode in the real life. And they actually learned that again, like a few with a grain of salt because that was not so far more fun evaluation. But this is very promising and uh, my research agenda is like really focusing on this thing. So if you're interested in this research, I'm happy to talk after. So how well do we understand data that is represented visually? Uh, decoding and understanding visualization is a complex activity that requires knowledge and skill and visualization education can help. We should engage in like more of those uh, exercises early on in school. So I don't have many more slides, I will, I will be quick. So how well can we, that's my last question, how well can we communicate data visualization? So I talked about uh, decoding uh, visualization, but there's a strong part uh, of literacy that is creating and authoring. So if we had better educated people, hopefully we could avoid like those, you know, examples that I showed at the beginning of the talk where the numbers don't add up. Uh, and so in fact, there is a huge barrier for pe to people engaging with data uh, because the, the tools are just too complex. People can't really author visualization. They can't really engage with their own data because they don't, they don't have the tools to, to do that. And so I believe that actively taking part in the process of working with data and visual representation is also key to critical thinking because as you make your own mistakes, as you understand the limitations of your data, as you understand the challenge in showing data and encoding data visually, you better understand what other have been through and you may have like a better critical view on, on other visualization. So there are some projects that are really like that allow the general population to actually engage with data and data visualization. This one is very approachable. It's like a coloring book, and like those relaxing coloring book with like the abstract patterns. This one is a more serious uh, topic. It's about climate change, and then uh, you go on. You have like white pages, and you take your coloring crayons and then you you make the visualization yourself with this scaffold behind and then you learn about you know facts about climate change and then you engage in the nice activity that is coloring not, not so relaxing for the, for the fact here but uh, still like it's a, it's a way to engage more actively in the, in the process of uh, being um, looking at the data and so this is an example of somebody making a coloration of a map following the, the timeline. And I want to bring your attention to this one. This one has an interesting component because it has a time component. So the challenge is to be able to color like the, the size of a soccer field, like those many soccer fields within one minute. And this is actually uh, the number of fields that you see here is how many like a forest is being deforested like a, on the basis, on the minute basis. And so the challenge is that can you be like as fast as coloring as people are as quick as, you know, like cutting trees. And this is hard. Almost, yeah, time is almost up. No, so they didn't succeed. So we are less quick at uh, coloring these little squares than, you know, the, we lose forests on a minute basis. So engaging with data in this way is like very meaningful to people and hopefully it, it helps have a better 
more critical view on, on things in general. So data can be also playful and personal on a lighter note. Uh, so in this project, how many of you have heard about Dear Data? Yes, Raphael. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know this project, it's a fantastic project. I encourage you to, to watch online. Uh, so these are two artists that met at a conference and they decided to actually collect data uh, about their daily you know, experience. And they would pick a theme on a weekly basis. It could be anything. Uh, for example, uh, how many doors and what types of doors have opened over the week. And that's the type of the data that they've been collecting. And they would go on and create a, a postcard uh, that visually represent this data on the common theme for the week and send to their mate uh, by mail. And so there are like plenty of fantastic, really creative uh, ideas. This one is great, like the doors, like was the door heavy? Was it an elevator door? It's, it's pretty much useless, right, data? But uh, I mean, that might, you know, like a, you might gain insights if you are like, uh, how many times do I check my emails? Or, uh, how many cigarettes do I smoke? If you collect this data, personal data, you may like, you know, raise awareness. And it's like a better way of engaging with data and visualization because it's data about you. Small data, no big data. And personal data, no public data. That's you. So that's another um, trick and mechanism that we can use like, to engage people better. But Achieving these results with screen tool is pretty much impossible, especially for a layman. You wouldn't, you know, go on Tableau or Excel and be able to do that. You put your table and that's, you, you get boring bar charts. And so this is because it mixes like this creative process of drawing and sketching and like having those drawings be meaningful in terms of what is the data behind that uh, they represent. So we worked with colleagues at UFT and uh, Microsoft Research on a project that we uh, called Data Inc. So inking with data. So this one is inspired by uh, Dear Data. It's not one of their designs, but one of their data sets. It's uh, imagine that you collected the emotion that you had over the week. Um, one drop correspond to one emotion. The bigger the drop, the like, more you know, important the emotion. And the darker the drop, the darker the thoughts. So sad emotion. So you want to have like tiny or like big light drops. <laughs> and so this is difficult to achieve, but we actually try to have this uh, nice uh, meeting between drawing and sketching on a tablet and uh, tying these drawings to, to data. The video is going to be a bit fast. I'm sorry about that. Um, but see how we can actually present this. So you would draw a drop, and then the drop would replicate as many times as you have data set. And basically, you can uh, manipulate the graphical properties of each drop and tie those to data. And so if you say like the luminance is going to be tied to the uh, like sadness of the thought, it's going to automatically like go from light blue to dark blue based on the data each drop is corresponding to. And so we had like fantastic, like this one has been authored by by one of our great computer graphics student uh, at the lab. He's very skilled in drawing and sketching. And you can do like very complex uh, designs that are not otherwise possible. So it alleviates the need to draw every single data item manually because you have now the graphics being bind to binded to data. And so hopefully through this mechanism, we can you know, encourage people to engage more with data. So how well can we communicate uh, data visually? It's not uh, easy, actually. There are many challenges, especially with the tool that we have currently. And so we believe that by reconciling creative drawing and data binding, and also like having the data being personal, we can engage people with data a little bit more. And that applies to children as well. So next on my plate, trying to apply these kind of concepts with like young audiences. So to conclude, being critical think thinker, um, when presented with evidence-based uh, reasoning remains a challenge because data is always noisy, dirty, and uncertain that we know uh, from this very famous um, data superstar that I encourage you to check out if you don't know about him, Alberto Cairo. Um, but so is the way how we portray and perceive data. That's my contribution to this talk, hopefully, uh, that I conveyed. 
And so the, the key uh, takeaway message that uh, I wanted to communicate is like by, uh, we can cult cultivate critical thinking through these actions, I believe, by um, making data more relatable to people through like mechanisms like concrete scales, educate people about data and visualization that is critical and I'm working on it, but we need more <laughs> workforce on that. I cannot solve the world alone. <laughs> and um, engage people in thinking with and through data in a creative manner that can be you know, a powerful mechanism as well. So with that, I will leave you one with one, not so meaningful, but a chart that I love. This is not a pie chart, but this can be. And I will leave uh, the stage for Ishtiak. Thank you.